Thank you very much, Rachel, and good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you all for staying on to hear the last two uh, presentations. Mike and I are sworn to make this an exciting time of the day, so let's hope we can repay your faith in staying with us. Um, as Rachel said, Oliver had unfortunately to, to cancel due to family circumstances uh, late on, uh, but helpfully he sent me copious technical notes late last night, which I spent most of the day trying to digest, and hopefully we can represent pretty fairly what uh, we did uh, on East Lomond. Now, I know in the audience I see a number of faces who were there on the excavation. There's at least, I think, about a dozen of the excavators here. Uh, there are also a number of others who came to visit us up on site, uh, and we took a tour of what was happening. So, some of the stuff that I'm going to present to you, you may have seen already, because we have talked at TAFAC before. I'm going to quickly skip from the 214 excavation to the 217, and then on to 219, because this is an evolving story. And as I hope to show you today, it's an evolving story that could take us decades into the future working on East Lomond. It is that significant. So without further ado, there's more to this than meets the eye, EL19 presentation. And I'm going to start with this image, which I know many of you are familiar with. Um, this is the uh, historic illustration by Bob Marshall, a respected illustrator who walked over the hill with Oliver O'Grady and myself uh, in 2014. And it is still pretty accurate. This is much more than a best guess. The, the, uh, the, the scale of the hill, the topography, where the walls are, is all accurate. And I think the only thing I would say from this year's excavation is that this annex here actually is much larger than we originally thought in 2014. And I'll show you an image which might uh, blow your mind in that respect. But that's a fairly good image of what East Lomond looked like in the post-Roman in the Pictish period. Um, some of the finds uh, which were uh, diagnostic in uh, 2014, shale armlets and bangles, and they find more shale on, on each of the excavations and canal coal and possible jet. Uh, oh, oh, too fast, too fast. Uh, the kitchen tools, the possible hammer stones, quern fragments, spindle whorls, whetstones, what you would expect to find uh, in a significant settlement, but also a crucible fragment indicating that there's other kinds of activity going on up there by the, the, the domestic crucible fragment used for, for smelting. Um, so that was 14. So at the end of our 14 excavation, these were the conclusions that we were drawing from that initial trench, a 5 by 10 metre trench in 14. Uh, I won't go over them, we have lots of slides backing all this up. But everything was pointing to a high status site. Uh, and the Pictish stuff that was coming through, together with the late Roman stuff, was giving us a clear indication that we were dealing with something rather special. So, on to 2017, and one of the first things that we excavated, and I know that there are people here who worked on this uh, raised pathway, we have this raised pathway with the large curb stones um, holding them in. And if you look at the front of this pathway and look at the way that these stones are placed, because some people did come from uh, one of our nearby universities and suggest that this might have been covered with dirt and turf. But we believe that the engineering that is evident at the front of this, it's almost like crazy paving, it was too sophisticated to be anything other than a pathway. And when it rains up on that site, and becomes claggy, you understand why they would want to build a pathway. It's similar to the one that uh, Peter Yeoman and uh, Steve Driscoll excavated at Edinburgh Castle uh, in the 90s, um, except theirs was about 150 years after this. The dating, the C14 dating from here, is circa 650 AD. And we have this uh, quite extensive pathway up on the hill, which we know veers off into the landscape. We also found in 2017 one of these, and there's one of these displayed in the National Museum in Chambers Street in Edinburgh. And I can recall with uh, great joy the person who was on his first ever excavation, on his first day on the site, and he finds one of these. And it's an ingot mould, uh, and it dates from that post-Roman Pictish period, if you like. Uh, the rulers there for, for the, the, the sense of scale. And of course, those of us who attended the various talks that Fraser Hunt has given Scotland's early silver know that um, Roman, all, all Scotland's early silver is Roman. And um, 
what the Pictish peoples or the local peoples did was melt these down in these moulds. And here's a bar from Fife, uh, from Clatchet Craig, and there's another one from the Gold Cross Road in Aberdeenshire. So they're smelting down Roman silver using these moulds, and they're making these silver bars, which they're trading between the tribes. And what are they doing with these bars? Well, we know what they're doing in Fife. Five, six miles as the crow flies from East Lowland is Largo Law, Norris Law, and you're looking at the Norris Law Board. Um, these, one of which some of you will know is an original, and one of which is a copy by that crooked silversmith in Cooper all those years ago, uh, thanks to Dr. Alice Blackwell's uh, work at the National Museum. But this is the kind of thing they're making with these uh, silver bars. Uh, we now have evidence, and more evidence than we had previously, that there's smelting as well as ironworking, as well as blacksmithing going on at the top of East Lomond. This hill that you can normally see from here every day, except on days like this. Okay, uh, this is the 2017 uh, trench, the blue circle area with the raised pathway. Some of you may remember from the last uh, talk we gave this, this uh, quenching tank here, this whole area is a blacksmithing area full of hammer scale, uh, debris of metal working, and this quenching tank. Uh, the quenching tank, if you recall, uh, for those who have heard this talk before, had that piece of mica schist, that big quarter of a quernstone deposited beside it, which Professor um, oh, Edinburgh University of Geophysics, who came up to the hill, said to me was, this is north of the Highland Fault. This is mica schist from way up north, and it probably dates to that period when the Picts were establishing hegemony after Nechtan's Mere in the late uh, seventh century. And it's positioned here. It is not a Fife stone. It's a stone that sparkles in the sun. So he's either an itinerant blacksmith or he's part of that wave that establishes the Pictish kingdoms on the east of, of Scotland. And of course, we have the earlier phase down at the bottom um, and the hearth. So that's uh, indicated in red here. And this was our hearth sequence, again, which is unique in a Scottish context. On the top of a Scottish hill fort, you maybe find one or two hearths, and it tends to be soil, then you're into the bedrock. But here, if you look closely, you can actually make out a sequence of five stacked hearths in the one spot. That's testament to a longevity of occupation on this particular area of the hill that we're excavating over probably 150, 200 years. And beside that, of course, we find uh, various um, pieces that made up a very interesting assemblage, and it was no different this year. One of the big finds from um, the 2017 excavation was it extended the sequence of dates that we had on East Lomond. Uh, in the first 2014 excavation, we had securely dated samples from 52 AD through to 650 AD, so a first to the seventh centuries in the first millennium. And here we have the remains of a robbed Bronze Age kist, which uh, the girls from St. Andrew's High School in Kirkcaldy uh, excavated. You can see West Lomond in the background, so it's looking towards West Lomond. And in here, there were two sets of cremated remains, which are Dr. Alison Sheridan rushing across from the National Museum. And she supported us to get a report based on on the remains, but that took the dates from 52 AD back to circa 1800 BC. So we began to see that this is a much bigger and longer lived area than we had previously suspected. So why did the 17 excavation excite us? Well, this is an unknown site. I have read so many books and done so much research trying to find a name for this settlement outside the hill fort, outside the scheduled area, I can't find it. Um, we have a lengthy sequence of occupation from the Bronze Age onwards. We have our soil samples, lots of evidence of contact, including e-ware, which is only found at royal sites, normally uh, on the west coast, comes up through, uh, it's made in France, and it usually comes up through Tintagel and finds its way up to the western uh, side of the country, used to transport oils and dyes that you can't uh, manufacture here. We have lots of evidence of smelting and production, and we have that hearth sequence. And that turns out to be all in 1% of the size of the site 
that they now believe we're looking at. So, on to 2019 and this year. And what did we decide to do? Well, we didn't want to put another single deep trench in because you begin to pop mark the site with, with holes. We didn't want to do that. So we decided uh, as a strategy to commission uh, stage one as a big geophysics scan. And a number of people here uh, came up and helped us with that scan. We brought in a big bit of kit from Germany, it took five people to manoeuvre over four hectares. And we did that over four days up on the hill. We involved volunteers in local schools, secondary schools, uh, in the exercise. And we, we did about four, circa four hectares, and we produced an interpretive report. We wanted to do that scanning in order to determine the potential trench locations for uh, this summer and test the veracity of the scan results. So what you're about to see now, I hope interests you as it interested me when we first saw it. That's the area. Area one is the Falkland Estate. Uh, we took it out with the scheduled monument area. Area two is delineated by a fence, and that's Balburnie Estate. That's the Balfour land. But uh, Robert Balfour is quite happy that we were able to, to, to work on that with them. And this is some of the indicative, indicative results of the scan. The blue box that you can see is where we excavated in 14 and 17. The red line that you can see above the scan area is the delineation of the scheduled monument. So we're outside the scheduled monument. We're on the shoulder of the hill. We seem to have a huge boundary wall that encloses a number of areas, quite distinct areas, on the uh, shoulder of East Lobin, looking south. So it's overlooking Glenrothes, Kirkcaldy, to the fourth, and Edinburgh beyond. And the size of this uh, settlement is uh, really quite something. And there's, there's more stuff that has slipped away on the eastern edge of that, as you can see. But you have a natural, because we do have a, uh, some images of the bedrock, we have a natural uh, volcanic feature, and there's a wall which appears to have been built on on top of a natural bedrock feature. So you can see, when I say we might be doing archaeology up there for another couple of decades, that there's plenty of challenge archaeologically uh, on East Lomond. So our original plan to do a couple of digs and then talk to Historic Environment Scotland about digging in the hill fort may be delayed because there's plenty here to keep us occupied for quite some time. And in relation to Historic Environment Scotland, the, the Trust has just signed a partnership agreement with Historic Environment Scotland. So we're going to be collaborating uh, when we do our geophysics and they are doing some of their aerial scanning work. We're going to we are going to be collaborating with them as we take the archaeology programme forward uh, on uh, East Lomond. The geophysics report that accompanied uh, that image uh, raises the possibility the discovery of a very rare archaeological site of national importance. And we certainly think uh, we're looking at that. Um, and with all applications, we always say, and you could do more. Give us some money and we'll do more for you. And I'm sure we will uh, over a period of time. But we do, we are a trust, we are a charity. Um, so we, we need to raise the funds uh, to, to take the, the, the archaeology agenda forward on East Lomond. And so to 19, and so to this year. Now, we're very fortunate um, that we have Oliver uh, working with us. Um, we were also very fortunate on the day that this photograph was taken, because if you remember this year, it was horrendous. This was a very tricky uh, excavation. We lost three days because of the weather. Um, the, whether it was the rain or the thick mist that you couldn't see your feet, never mind anything else around about you. Um, not all days were like this, um, but we, we dadded ahead. Uh, and here's, uh, here's our camp. And you can see this kind of slightly misty view. Um, we've got a couple of trenches here looking down towards the fourth. Um, and I think we spent quite a lot of time in our, in our tent, but it gives you some idea of the size and scale of where we are. Then we're looking back up towards uh, the ramparts on the top of the hill. You can see West Lomond away in the background. Um, and, and here's one of the, the trenches we took over the boundary wall. But it gives you, you can see all four areas of excavation. We, we, there was, there's actually five, there's one just beyond the horizon. But that gives you some sense of the scale of it. We're on either side of the natural gully, which we believe is the original entranceway into the hill fort. 
Um, and these shots were made possible by uh, the SCAPE project at Andrews University. And thanks in particular to Ellie Graham, who, who brought her drone and managed to get some good uh, shots for us before the weather closed in. And in return, we took some of the Andrews students who can now uh, choose an archaeology module. Um, and, then, and we didn't know that because we knew they, they closed down their archaeology uh, section a number of years ago. But we had some students uh, who were happy to add on to the dig. And in return, quid pro quo, they did the drone work for us. So it was a win-win situation all around. So good, good battering and good links with uh, our local academic institution. Um, just to show the uh, area that we're looking at, um, the red circle is the scheduled. The red circle is the scheduled monument area, and our trenches are down here. Um, there are six identified here. Um, we opened five trenches because we did lose uh, three days because of the weather, and the trenches are all named. We all have an identifying number, and I'm now going to go through. Thanks to Oliver's copious technical notes. <clears throat> I'm now going to go through a, a, a couple of slides for each trench and talk to you about what we think we've got uh, this year. Now, we didn't go deep. We went shallow because we were testing the results of the scan. We wanted to see what we were hitting. And it's fair to say that each trench hit solid archaeology and some very interesting archaeology up on the hill over a, an area of about 75 to 80 metres. And you multiply that by another two, and you'll get some idea of the, the, the size of the, the actual site. So here we go. And bear with me, because I will have to refer to some of the notes I managed to pull together from Oliver's uh, guidance to me. Um, this is an aerial shot. It just gives you a sense of, of where we are uh, up on the hill. Uh, for those of you who know the hill, that is... That's the last gate that you go through when you come up, uh, and that's the van. Um, that gives you some idea of the sense of, of, of where we are. So we're on the shoulder before you get to the summit of East Lomond. And the first trench we look at is Trench W. And you can begin to make out here a kind of diagonal sweep of stones uh, coming across it. But that's not what we had been looking for. We had been looking for a line of stones that cut straight across this. Um, so. Uh, this was a surprise, uh, which is why we've, we've taken a trench, a slot down uh, even deeper uh, over here. Here's this diagonal wall, which you can see beginning to emerge, and three very clear posts. The, the wood is still in situ, these brown circles that appear in, uh, for, for decayed wood, very, very clear. But we still didn't see the um, straight wall that was cutting right across it. Now, I know that there's someone here who took a particular interest in this uh, particular uh, trench. Down here, you'll see we've put shale working area debris and a copper alloy find. We did find a copper alloy fragment with a stud down here. The shale working area debris was actually a stash of shale in a circular shape, packed in. And shale up here is being worked. If you remember the, the armlet, maybe some of you have heard the uh, the 17 top before, the big armlet that Alice Roberts was very keen to wave about when uh, she was looking at this on the TV. But in here, beside these stones, we have a lot of shale packed together. So this is someone's working assemblage of shale. We already have shale things from up there and shale moulds, and we're pretty close to where someone was working. But still, we didn't see the straight wall. So we did take that... Um, that uh, that side over here where the people are standing, we did take that down deeper. And that's what it began to, we began to get. This, this is it's quite odd when you see things back to front up here and you, you're looking at it on the screen here, but bear with me. The wall begin, the straight wall begins to, to become very clear. And in this area here, we find this. And I know the finder is sitting somewhere Oh, yes, he's blushing. He's blushing. <laughs> it survived Bob's mattocking. Um, but it was a pristine piece. And we showed this to Torben Ballin. And Torben came back, immediately said, this is a beautiful piece. 
it looks as though it had been napped yesterday and it would still cut you. And he uh, described it as a leaf-shaped, drop-shaped, definitely flint, dating to the early Neolithic, 4000 to 3500 BC. So our timescales are now going back even further. So that big map or that indicative map that I showed you, you mustn't think that it was almost that size because I think this settlement has contracted and expanded over several thousand years. And if this dates to 4000 BC, we're actually talking about 6,000 years of occupation on that hill. And we have a positive palimpest uh, up there on East Lomond, which is going to keep us, I think, busy for many years to come. So this lower wall that we had been looking for from the scan was actually below the surface and other things had been superimposed on top, both an arcing circular structure of stone and then a straight, a straighter, lighter structure with wooden posts. So on this part of the site, you have a settlement over a very long period of time. It's possible this, this here, this, this um, arrowhead has been washed down uh, from a structure further up, but only further excavation will determine that. I'm going to look now at trenches J1 and J2, which are both prominent anomalies um, uh, on the hill and, and in the, uh, the, the, the scan that we did. And J1 proved to be highly productive. Uh, I don't know why Oliver has given me this kind of fancy slide. I'm the one kneeling at the, at the trench, and Oliver is gassing away to Peter Yeoman, who's uh, well known of this parish. And Peter came up to, to visit us uh, on a couple of occasions. Um, as Fife's former county archaeologist, he was interested to see uh, what was going on. And Trench 1, um, we did bring out uh, working debris. Now, what it, where it says pit, that circular structure there, and I thank Gemma Crookshanks over at the National Museum of Scotland, who's looked at uh, our iron working and our slag material. That was a very solid furnace base. So we've come across yet another furnace. And between 14 and 17 and 19, we have at least, at least three furnace bases and at least four hearths uh, in a fairly small area of East Lomond. Um, we also, uh, if you can look to the right there, here we are. It's a, it's a very fine copper ring uh, which had snapped in two. That's currently with Will Murray at the conservation studio over in Edinburgh. Uh, so he's working to get that looking good, and, and a spindle whorl. So we've got a very busy area, um, not far below the surface. Most of these trenches are about a foot below the surface. So you're walking over what you think is moorland, but actually not far below the surface, there's a hell of a lot of archeology span um, uh, sitting there. So trench one, very productive. Um, the remains of a hearth there as well. And most of the finds are sitting around the hearth, and that echoes what we have found in in 17, where uh, various bits of armlet and bangles were found around a hearth area. Trench J2, uh, a different kind of trench. We're looking at the partly robbed uh, building remains here. Um, um, we think we've got a, well, that's it in context of, of the hill. We actually wondered whether trench one and sorry trench J one and J two were connected. They look as though they might be connected um, uh, on the scan, but we took it would have been an enormous trench if we'd uh, and we'd have done nothing else if we just excavated that. So J one's at one side of this structure, J two is at the other side of the structure. J two is the the one to the bottom of the image here, and this is J two, and we clearly have the terminus of a stone wall footing, which possibly had a uh, turf on top of it. That's the, the yellow line there. So we've got the end point. We've got some post settings around that and a robbed out paving uh, area and an incised stone. There's a couple of points to make about trench J2. If indeed it does connect with J1, then you're talking about a very substantial building, almost a Picardic type building. Um, uh, up there on East Lomond. But uh, that's for speculation because the thing that we don't have at the moment is C14 dating. We've worked with AOC, who've give, who's looked at the, the, um, the charcoal samples, 75% of which can be dated. So we're now at the stage to put them for dating. 
And we've got certainly the, the iron working report from Gemma over at the museum. Um, but let me show you the incised stone. And now, we're going to get some people to look at this because it's a bit of a mystery. Um, these are very definite man-made lines. Now, for all I know, it says number five, the hill. <laughs> Who knows? It may say something more significant, um, but it, they are certainly man-made. These are not natural fractures uh, on the stone, and they're found at that terminus come entranceway into that side of the building. So what it means, we don't yet know, because we're still in the middle um, of our post-X work, including the C14 dating. Trench H, uh, this was another very intriguing uh, trench. It, it appeared to be a square anomaly uh, on the geophysics. Um, and closer up, you can see that we have a, a line of stones, and there's a whole range of scatter of rubble beyond that. But within that uh, rubble, um, we have metal working. We have Roman Iron Age material. Um, uh, rotary corn fragments, quetstone fragments, all coming out from uh, from in here. The Roman material that we picked up is it's a rim shared. It's uh, red Oxfordshire ware. It's almost identical to some of the Roman material that we picked up in the 2017 excavation. And that site in 17 is about 10 metres to the north of, of this trench here. Uh, Again, without the C14 dating, it's going to be difficult to say too much at this point in time. But we knew we wanted to come and share some of the early findings and some of the images from this year. And then finally, there's Trench X, which we believe is a boundary feature. Uh, we thought we'd identified this in 2014. And it's a large wall, and it's located on the break of the slope. Um, and the wall, we believe, is about 2.5 to 3 metres thick. And go back to what I said, when you're walking across this landscape, you think, you think you're just walking on moorland. And about a foot down, you come across uh, rubble, you go further down, and you're actually looking at a huge, substantial wall. And this wall runs, we believe, right across the site. Um, I think we have the next image, which shows this. No, that's, that's looking at the wall from above. Um, and you get a sense of, with the, with the one meter uh, pole, what we're looking at. It's clearly a lot kind of rubbed out. But that, this is what we think, this is where we think the wall runs. It runs right along the side of the hill. Remember that, that um, geophysics image that I showed earlier on? This is the main wall. And there's the inner rampart, which, is, which delineates the uh, scheduled monument area uh, up top. So what we have here is clear evidence of a, an outer annex. And we'll await the C14 dates for this to see if it does fit into that pattern of, of nuclear fort and annex uh, of the early medieval period. OK. Um, a great big thank you to the team. I, to I told you what it was like on some days. Here's a fairly average day this year. In fact, I think probably most days uh, are like this. Uh, I can see some of my colleagues here. I can see Mike and Bob, Mary and a few others who are there, some stalwarts. And I can see you there, Sue, as well. Um, it was a trial, but it was so worth the investment of time and the perseverance. So a great big thank you to the volunteers. I think East Lomond has absolutely enormous potential. Um, we are beginning to think, looking at the size and scale of what we've got here, but it's a kind of sister hill to Traprain. It is that big. It is that big, and it is that deep. And we know in 17, although we went down a metre, we took some more off before we went, and we're still seeing halves that must date back beyond the Iron Age. And that's in, on one side. So this is, this is something that is going to uh, keep us busy for many years to come. Um, there are lots of questions that are beginning to emerge, not least the development of the, the kind of southern Pictish area uh, the emergent kingdoms of southern Pictland from that Roman Iron Age period. And that is one of the intriguing ones. But what we are now seeing with arrowheads from 4000, and B, uh, 4000 BC is much, much earlier activity. So there have been people up there working, ruling, living for an awful long time. And it all remains to be unpicked by the gallant band of volunteers 
who you see here. So thank you, everyone, and thanks for the talk. Thank you.